Most feeder cattle eventually end up on a high grain finishing diet to produce a quality product at the lowest cost possible. Reducing cost of production can usually be achieved by maximizing performance, specifically improving feed efficiency. This can be achieved by increasing the energy density in the diets we feed the cattle. The economics of feeding cattle is all about energy intake and how much that energy costs. Energy intakes drive per cattle performance. In fact, most nutritionists use some variation of NRC summary, summaries to predict animal performance. These equations work pretty good, especially if we have a good handle on what intakes are. There's a lot of variation in prices and energy content of feed ingredients. Grains usually cost more per ton than forages, especially when the forage contains a lot of water. However, grains contain a lot more energy, and as a result, they are typically the cheapest source of energy. Grains are also the most simple to handle and process. As well, feeding grains contribute to improved carcass traits, including whiteness of the fat and increased marbling. This slide shows what happens when we increase grain content of our diets. In this example, our most expensive ingredient, which is barley, at $290 per ton, increases from 42% up to 86.5%. As a result, our ration costs uh, increase from 258 up to $317 per ton. As grain levels increase, our energy density increases from 1.1 megacals per kilogram up to 1.35. And as a result, our daily gain increases from 3 up to almost 3 and 3 quarters pound per day. Our feed efficiency improves, and as a result, although our, ingre our ration costs increase, our cost of gain decreases from 94 down to 90 cent per pound. With the incentive to feed high grain diets comes a few challenges. Most energy is digested in the rumen, resulting in production of volatile fatty acids, including lactic acid, both of which can be directly or indirectly used as an energy source by the cattle. All the levels of VFA in the rumen are typically much higher than lactate. Lact lactate is much stronger and can contribute more to some of the challenges to feeding high grain diets. The rumen contains populations of bacteria that both produce and utilize lactate. Increasing populations of lactate utilizers is an important part of adapting cattle to high grain diets. Abrupt changes in intake of grain can result in large increases in acids, especially lactate, which can be fatal to the cattle. Acidosis can also reduce rumen function that can contribute to health challenges such as bloat. As well, Health challenges such as polio and cephalomalacia, laminitis, and even infectious diseases can result from or be amplified by acidosis. Consistently, acidosis coincides with reduced intake. This can contribute to improved feed efficiency, but can result in reduced gains if excessive. Today's discussion of acidosis challenges will be centered around liver abscesses. Through the discussion, it is assumed that increased acidosis coincides with increased liver abscess potential. Continuous and excessive high levels of acids in the rumen can cause physical changes and even damage the rumen wall. This is referred to as rumenitis. Rumenitis can even include deterioration of tissue integrity and can allow microorganisms to enter the bloodstream, which flows into portal veins and feeds directly to the liver. Managing liver abscesses is really about managing rumen acid levels. Liver abscesses are not evident by looking at the live cattle. However, on rare occasions an abscess can rupture, resulting in acute septic shock and death. There are several dietary factors that contribute to differences in acid potential. For example, the type of grain we feed has a large effect. With similar processing, wheat is digested more rapidly than barley, so can result in increased acid production. Due to the smaller kernel size and absence of a hull, wheat is also the most difficult to process. Barley is also more rapidly digested than corn. However, because intakes of dry rolled corn diets are usually higher than barley diets, acidosis and liver abscesses can be comparable. Although high grain diets always produce high levels of acids, we often most clearly see the effects on intake during the adaptation period. 
in the classic research by Fulton and co-workers at the University of Nebraska, intakes and lactate levels were documented through the adaptation period for cattle fed wheat and corn. This graph shows how intakes were affected as cattle were adapted from a 35% to a 90% concentrate diet for both corn and wheat. Intake of the corn diet is represented by the solid line. Intake of the wheat diet is represented by the dotted line. Average intakes were lower and more variable for the wheat-based diets. Lactate levels were also documented through the adaptation period. Each diet was fed for five days. Values are the average from four animals. Notice how levels of lactate are at their highest point on day one of the 35% concentrate diets and decline each day it is fed. By the time cattle are on the 75% concentrate diet, levels are about 1 20th of the initial levels. For cattle fed wheat, lactate levels started over twice as high as the cattle based diet. As with the corn diet, lactate levels declined with days fed. By the end of the adaptation period, levels are similar to the corn based diet. This trial demonstrates two important points. First, starch digestion and acid levels are very different based on grain source. Second, dietary changes have a large impact on ruminal acid levels. Particle size of the diet also influences the acid, acid production. The smaller the particle size, the greater the surface area for digestive enzymes to work on, and the more rapid and extensive the digestion will be. We have added a lot of small particles into our diets with dried distiller's grains. Although distiller's grains are not a source of starch, they can be high in energy, so all the fiber they provide might not be helping much for digestive challenges. How we process our grain can also influence digestibility and acid production. Aggressively dry rolling barley typically results in a lot of small particles that will be rapidly digested, contributing to potential acid accumulation. Adding water through tempering or steam processing helps the kernel stay intact and reduces the small particles. Dry rolled barley can be fed effectively, but tempering the grain helps ensure the rollers can be set to hit the small kernels without making flour out of the big kernels. Grain processing has a large impact on digestion and acid production in the rumen. From research conducted at the Lethbridge Research Center, we can see that percent digestion of the grain increases as processing becomes more aggressive. This in turn results in lower pH or more acid production in the rumen. Increased acid production is a challenge producers need to manage as processing the grain aggressively generally results in improved feed efficiency. This slide summarizes three different trials that demonstrate that feed conversion is improved as processing becomes more aggressive. More days on a finishing diet means more likelihood of liver abscesses. This is why Holsteins have more liver abscesses than beef breeds. As well, higher intakes contribute to more liver abscesses. This is thought to be the reason that steers typically have higher incidence of liver abscesses than heifers. Severity of liver abscesses have been ranked on a scale from 0 to 3, or 0, A minus, A, and A plus. Any abscess can remove a liver from the human food chain. Severe abscesses can even remove a liver from the pet food chain. Elenco Animal Health is recognized as providing these pictures and also having done a lot of work monitoring liver abscesses. Several trials have found that minor liver abscesses do not affect animal performance. In fact, the minor abscesses in Brink's summary appear to be associated with improved performance. This shouldn't be too surprising as cattle with the most aggressive appetites often gain the most but often suffer the most digestive challenges. So unless the abscesses are severe, animal performance won't be negatively affected. Even four of the nine trials summarized by Brink and co-workers found that A-plus livers did not affect performance. As well, in an Oklahoma summary, cattle with A-plus livers at harvest had superior gains early in the feeding period, but had reduced performance later on. For example, most of the trials summarized by Brink and co-workers 
a reduction in carcass weight and feed efficiency for cattle with A-plus livers would result in over a $50 loss per animal in today's market. Some of the reduction in carcass weight can be due to carcass trim when liver abscesses adhere to the carcass. There have been summaries compiled on the effects of A-plus liver abscesses on carcass traits, the most notable being the reduction in carcass weight. While those selected trials summarized by Brink showed a 29-pound reduction in carcass weight, most trials record between 9 and 13-pound reduction. The Elenco compilation is notable in this group as the largest data set and is collected in the Cargill plant at High River, Alberta. This data was collected from February to May of 2011. Data came from a total of 198 different feed yards. Direct costs of A-plus livers to a producer can result from the reduced carcass weight, which is averaged close to 12 pounds in most summaries. Based on Brink's summary, a 10% reduction in efficiency of carcass gain would be conservative. With ration prices near $300 per ton of dry matter, this reduction in feed efficiency would cost close to $60 per animal. This means that for each 5% of animals that have A-plus abscesses equates to an average cost of $4.20 per animal. The Canadian Cattlemen's Association has sponsored beef quality audits. Compared to the 1999 audit, the 2010 and 11 audit reported considerably more A-plus livers and a reduction in livers suitable for human consumption. The net result is more than a $20 million increased cost to the industry due to liver defects since 1999. Reduced carcass and liver value in the 2010 audit cost an average of $9.36 for animals sold. One of the primary factors that likely contributes to the increased levels of liver abscesses in the later audit is likely the increased use of wheat. This table documents the price differences between wheat and barley in 1999 compared to 2010 and 11. The last row of the audit documents the cost of energy from barley as a percentage of the cost of energy from wheat. In 1999, energy from barley was only 97% of the cost of energy from wheat. As a result, very little wheat would have been fed. By 2011, the cost of energy from barley was about 5% higher than that from wheat. As a result, there was a lot of incentive to feed wheat. These calculations are based on book values and don't consider processing and digestive challenges that come with feeding wheat. Since the 1999 audit, dried distiller's grains are commonly included at 15-30% to of the diet. This is a highly digestible feed that provides a lot of small particles in the diet. As well, increased intakes associated with distiller's grains may also increase the incidence of liver abscesses. There are several areas of management that can influence the prevalence of liver abscesses, most of which are referred to as bug management. The rumen is a large fermentation vat with an incredible ability to extract energy and produce protein from the feed that is put into it. Like any good brewmaster or composter knows, fermentation is a delicate process that requires a consistent supply of nutrients. <coughs> Cattle have well-defined feeding periods, so consistency and timing of the feed delivery will help ensure they maintain a regular flow of feed into the fermenter. Accessibility to the bunk will also influence stability of intakes. This is influenced by pen and bunk space and how much competition there is to access the bunk. Similarly, mud, snow, or other impediments will influence how consistently cattle will be able to consume feed. Poor pen conditions resulting from the wet years in 2010 and 2011 may have also contributed to the increased levels of abscesses. Increasing fiber levels will typically reduce acidosis and liver abscess potential. Not only does it dilute grain content, Increasing fiber levels will increase chewing and salivation, resulting in increased remote buffering. Increasing levels of roughage will typically mean lowering the rate the levels of energy. Excess levels will definitely minimize acidosis and liver abscesses, but will reduce energy content and performance. As with grains, the larger the particle size, the lower the acidosis potential. 
finely ground products such as distiller screens or pelleted screenings can provide quite a bit of fiber but is likely not very effective in stimulating chewing and salivation. Their primary benefit in maintaining acidosis is simply in diluting the levels of starch in the diet. In avoiding, or more accurately, managing acidosis, it is important that cattle start out on a safe level of grain. I like to use a starting diet that contains between 40 to 45 percent grain on a dry matter basis. This is about 25 percent grain <coughs> on an as-fed basis in diets that contain a typical moisture level in their silage. This level provides enough energy for newly weaned calves and is also safe for the majority of the yearlings that come into the feed yard with rapidly climbing intake. Four transition diets with a minimum of four days on each diet will safely get cattle onto the finishing diet. More diets and days per diet can be used to minimize risks. Practices like introducing new rations on the second feed delivery will also help through the adaptation period. As already mentioned, the transition period is the most challenging period to get intake stabilized and commonly results in sudden drops in intake. This is likely a result of the majority of the cattle in the pen producing more acid than they are utilizing as the population of lactate utilizers grow. With economic incentive to maximize performance using diets that contain aggressively rolled grain containing little forage, there is motivation to use feed additives to help reduce liver abscesses. In Canada, only tylosin phosphate is cleared for this purpose. Although several other options are available in the U.S., tylosin consistently has been the most effective, demonstrating at least a 50% reduction in liver abscess levels. Although effects on liver abscesses have been too small to be detected, ionophores, specifically monensin, can help reduce the negative effects of acidosis by slowing down the eating rates. As well, they reduce the population of lactate producers. Some probiotics have been shown to have positive effects on lactate utilization, especially through the diet transition, but consistency in responses have been disappointing. Liver abscesses are a management challenge that requires a wise balance between animal performance and animal health. As with all areas required with successful cattle feeding, Consistency in attention to the details of the feeding program will help achieve that balance.